wide open. On August 6, 1945, an American atom bomb annihilated the city of Hiroshima, killing as many as 80,000 people. On August 9th, a second bomb decimated Nagasaki. 40,000 died, and the city lay in ruins. Six days later, Japan surrendered to the United States. In his radio address to the nation, the emperor never mentioned defeat or surrender. Instead, he told his people, we have to endure the unendurable and suffer the insufferable. The next day, on the 16th, we received a telegram ordering us to cease fire. Receiving this unthinkable telegram, we gradually grasped the reality. From then on, the real drama began on board. There was no concept of surrender and remaining alive in the Japanese Imperial Navy at the time. The captains of the two I-400s reversed course and raced back toward Japan. Neither wanted to give up his prized ship nor suffer the humiliation of being captured in enemy waters. Worried about retribution, Arizumi ordered the crews of the two subs to dump their U.S. Mark Seirans into the ocean. They did so, destroying the evidence just in time. On August 28th, two U.S. destroyers discovered the I-400. The captain surrendered peacefully. 20-year-old Harry Arvidson was one of the first Americans to board the giant sub. As we approached the submarine and saw what it was, I thought to myself, man, that's the biggest thing I ever seen. The next day, August 29th, the American submarine USS Segundo located the second Japanese sub. The I-401 was carrying fleet commander Arizumi, a man who didn't know the meaning of the word surrender. Carlo Carlucci was a quartermaster on the American sub. He had to be three or four o'clock in the morning before daybreak. That was when they picked it up on the radar. They didn't know what it was until they got fairly close. Sugio Yata was a young sailor on the I-401. We didn't want to give up this magnificent ship to the U.S. We thought it's a shame for it to be captured. Though the war was over, surrender did not come easy for the prideful Japanese sailors. Things were hot and cold. You never know, yes or no, whether they're going to shoot, not shoot. We were heading back to Japan but we talked about how to prevent the Americans from taking the sub. So we talked about sinking it near the coast. But before the Japanese could carry out their plan, the sub's engines temporarily failed. The Segundo signaled for the massive sub to surrender. Arizumi refused. Several tense hours passed with the Segundo's weapons trained on the I-401. Maneo Bondo remembers the capture. They pointed their cannons at us and ordered us to have one officer sent to their ship. We thought, what do you mean, send someone? You send someone to come get us. We insisted on displaying our pride and dealing with them man to man. Because Bondo spoke some English, he was picked to negotiate with the Americans. 
you force us to surrender. I said, if you force us to surrender, we will commit suicide. They said to me, Harakiri, no good. They understood the term Harakiri. Tokyo ordered the I-401 to surrender to the Segundo. Eventually, Commander Arizumi bowed to the inevitable. He had the black flag, the international naval signal of surrender, raised on his sub. For the proud commander, the humiliation was too much to bear. I went to get a cup of coffee and had just sat down. I heard a loud bang. That was the suicide. The captain and I rushed inside and we saw he'd taken his own life. I heard the captain say, he finally did it. Nearly 200 Japanese servicemen were taken prisoner that day. Sailors, pilots, and support crew. The American submariners seized control of the giant sub and quickly realized it was unlike any vessel they had ever seen. For machinist Paul Whitmer, the double hull design was a particular surprise. Lo and behold, we get to the engine room and there's a doorway to the neighbor's room next door. What the heck's going on here? We take a peek in there, there's another set of engines in there. The port and starboard engine rooms. We find out that there were two hulls bolted together. There were two submarines alongside each other. The Japanese crew remained on board, but with six Americans now in command. I had a 45, we all had 45s, and I had an extra clip of bullets in my jacket pocket. That's all. If I had to use it, I would have used it. Oh, it was, it was very tense. No one trusted anybody. We didn't know what to expect. We could have been overtaken, lickety-split. Was that we were way outnumbered. And if they decided to dive the boat, we couldn't have got out. The Americans chained the hatches open to prevent the Japanese from diving. But as time passed, tensions slowly eased between the former enemies. They now had a common goal, to get the subs safely back to Tokyo. In the engine room, we had to learn how to communicate with the Japanese. You know, they had to teach us and we had to teach them. We needed to know some of the words to describe an engine basic elementary grade school type communication and uh, trying to strike up a rapport and learning their symbols and their words for what's the name of this, what's the name of that. Both subs made it back to Tokyo where the prisoners were released. For the Americans, the next step was to bring the unusual ships home for further study. In November of 1945, they departed Japan for Hawaii. They arrived in Pearl Harbor just after New Year's Day, 1946. Navy engineers immediately began inspecting and recording every detail of the super sub's design. But by the spring of 1946, a new post-war reality had taken hold and the I-400s were once again shrouded in secrecy. This time, it was the United States hiding them from the Soviet Union. Large aircraft carrying submarines intended for strategic attack yes. on their enemies mm -hmm. are exactly the things you don't want the Russians to and have. And this is no. now the Cold War. That's right. Beginning, yes. The beginning of the Cold War. Take her down before we're spotted. Worried that the Russians would demand to inspect the subs, the US Navy made a hasty decision. On May 31, 1946, 
They sunk the I-400 off the coast of Pearl Harbor. Two days later, the I-401 joined it at the bottom of the sea. Two powerful weapons that never made it into battle, never had the chance to truly prove their worth. If the question is, would the I-400 operation decisively change the course of the Second World War, um, ultimately, no, I don't think exactly. so. It would have made uh, things worse in 1942, yes, but not in 1945. Correct. And but Japan surrenders because of the overwhelming material superiority of the United States. The United Good. States has got the willingness and the desire to deploy that overwhelming power. Ultimately, the I-400 arrived too late in the war to make a difference. But while its timing was flawed, its technology was ahead of its time. The innovative design became a model for future Cold War submarines and changed military thinking about how they could be deployed. In the 1950s, a new type of US submarine, the Regulus class, began patrolling the seas. It bore a striking resemblance to Japan's World War II super sub, though it launched missiles, not airplanes, from its deck-mounted hangar. I don't believe anyone previously had looked at submarines as a means of attacking an enemy's cities. And this idea we see today in the primary nuclear weapons of the United States, France, Britain, and even Russia being submarine-launched missiles to attack with nuclear warheads in enemy cities. Though we hope that their lethal force is never needed, each one of these powerful, stealthy submarines is a living testament to one of the greatest weapons that never did battle. The Secrets of the Dead investigation continues online. For more in-depth analysis and streaming video of this and other episodes, visit pbs.org. This Secrets of the Dead episode is available on DVD for $24.99 plus shipping. To order, call 1-800-336-1917.